Hello brothers and sisters in Christ. I just wanted to do an add-on to the question and answer that we did. Um, if you believe in the Millennial Kingdom, in other words the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, turn to Matthew chapter 18. I just got finished reading this chapter with the Lord and I'd like to just read it with you. It's just going to be a reading and we're going to talk about it and explain that this also shows that in that thousand year reign sin is still going to be there and there's still going to be punishment for sin. People are going to be going to hell. Okay. For Matthew chapter 18. Now remember, we can get instruction in righteousness all throughout the Bible. But one of the things we got to remember is there's instruction in righteousness and then there's doctrine. Sometimes they're both for us. Sometimes it's just the instruction in righteousness that's for us. The doctrinally, we got to remember who's it talking to and when. What dispensation. So Matthew chapter 18. At the same time came the disciples unto Jesus, saying, Who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Now we've got to stop there for a second. Remember, when Jesus was preaching, John was preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Jesus picked it up and started preaching, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The gospel that was being preached when Jesus was walking on this earth was repent and believe that he is their king. And, he, and if they did that, they rep as a nation, as they repented and believed that he is their king, he would have brought in a thousand year reign, where he would have ruled and reigned for a thousand years. But the Jewish people as a whole rejected Jesus Christ as their king. So that thousand year reign got put off. But what we're seeing here is Jesus is preaching about the, the kingdom of heaven. So even though it got put off until after the time of Jacob's trouble, this still applies to that thousand year reign that hasn't happened yet. And you have a lot of people out there that try to steal the, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. They try to. Today they think they can do it, they think they can get away with it. But Jesus is coming back to rule and reign for a thousand years at the end of the time of Jacob's trouble. After the catching away of the body of Christ. But here we are. Someone's asking them, who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? You know, I'm better than you. No, 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 I'm better than you. No, 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 I earned this. No, no, I earned this. No, I'm better. I'm... Who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Verse 2, And Jesus called a little child unto him, and set him in the midst of them, and said, Verily I say unto you, except ye be converted, be converted, and become as a little child, little, come as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Repent and believe that Jesus is their king. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Be converted. But you have to come to Jesus as a child. They've been taught traditions of men. They've been taught so much things. They're getting puffed up with their knowledge. They're getting prideful. Who's better than who? you got to give up all that stuff and be a child. And let Jesus rule and reign. Reign in your hearts for us today. But in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, he's, they got to let him rule and reign and obey him. Like a child would a parent. Do this. Yes, Dad. Yes, sir. I remember kids back in the past, when you were a little, chi little, little child, you'd say Daddy or Papa. But once you got to be in like 10 or 12 and you're doing work around the, the property with your dad, when he said do this, it was yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Why? Because... He's the authority figure. He's the one in charge. you got to be as a child. Uh, verse 4. Whosoever therefore shall humble himself as this little child, the same is greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Whosoever shall receive one such a little child in my name receiveth me. Once again, he says, in the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 6, But whosoever shall offend one of these little ones which believe in me. We're going to come back to that. It were better for him that a millstone were hanged around his neck and that he were drowned in the depths of the sea. Now we always take that and we take it to the extreme and say sexual perversion. Those men are so wicked and God's going to ugh, really give it to them. And we try and you see people grab this verse and they try to apply it today. But stop and think. He's talking about the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Today, people can get saved. 
and I know we take it to the extreme, but this includes anything. Parents that didn't raise their children right, that told their children God's not real, Jesus isn't real, taught their children how to live by the world and be of the world and in the world. That applies to them too. I've known parents that have gotten saved that have testimonies on how they were just the wicked parents, just the worst parents in the world. But God saved them. This says here, it was better that a millstone were cast hang around his neck and that they were drowned in the depths of the sea. There is no forgiveness. Today there is. So dispensationally, this is not for us. Another way to look at it is it says right there, I was telling a brother in Christ, he's like, you, you got that wrong, you got that wrong. And he looked in here and he stopped and was like, oh. Because verse 6, it says, but whoso shall offend one of these little ones, that's where they like to stop. And they skip the next part and say, it were better for him than a millstone. No, it says, little ones which believe in me. In that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, Everybody's going to have to go up every year and present themselves to Jesus Christ. They will be worshiping Jesus Christ. He is the King. Every child's going to know that Jesus is King. He's Lord of Lords, King of Kings, God Almighty, sitting on the throne in Jerusalem, ruling and reigning with a rod of iron for a thousand years. Now what happens if you offend one of these children that believe in Jesus in that time period? It's a severe punishment, whether it's physically offending them or, get, or spiritually trying to turn them against Jesus Christ. Something to think about. But there's a punishment. And the big thing about that teaching, brothers and sisters in Christ, that we did was is people were trying to say that there's eternal security in that time period. You're eternally secure, you're eternally secure, and we proved that you're not, but I'm going back here because this was just something that God put on my heart for us to read together, the whole chapter. And it's talking about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. There's punishment. Let's keep reading. Woe unto the world because of offenses. In that time period, he's going to be ruling and reigning with the rod of iron. As we keep reading, you're going to see that there's times where he can forgive somebody, and there's times where he's going to punish you and send you to hell. In that time period, he's going to rule and reign with the rod of iron. Brother says, there is no more sexual perversion in that it's going to be tolerated in that time period. If someone tries, punishment. There's no more um, feminism going to be tolerated when Jesus is ruling and reigning. The world tolerates it today because it's wicked, and the lowercase g of the God of this world is trying to run the world. Satan. Sexual perversion is tolerated today. Abuse uh, of children today is tolerated today. It won't be tolerated in a thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Abortion is tolerated today. It won't be tolerated in the time of Jacob's, uh, after the time of Jacob's trouble in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. It won't be tolerated. Think about offending one of these little ones. Abortion. Can God forgive a woman that's had abortion today? Absolutely. Absolutely. We have forgiveness today. This isn't for today. Doctrinally, it's for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, the kingdom of heaven. Instruction righteousness though, if people don't repent and get saved and turn from this wickedness of how they cheat, treat children today, they're gonna burn for all eternity, along with everybody else that rejected Jesus Christ. Talk about a punishment, but this is talking about getting punished on earth in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. So woe unto the world because of the offenses, for it must needs be that offenses come, but woe to that man to whom the offense cometh. Woe. No, 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 they're eternally secure. No, there is no eternal security in that time period. We've already talked about that. You see Jesus face to face, there's no faith, there's no belief. There's just your heart towards him being king and an authority over you reigning over you. Your heart on how you treat them during that thousand year period. Not you and me, but those who go through it. Okay. Verse 8. Wherefore, if thy hand or thy foot offend thee, cut them off and cast them from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life halt or maimed 
rather than having two hands or two feet to be cast into everlasting fire. Let that sink in. This is not for today. It's for the time of Jacob's trouble. Oh no, sorry. I keep saying that. The time of Je after the time of Jacob's trouble, the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Now, instruction righteousness, sometimes we grab this and say it's not doctrinally for the time of Jacob's trouble, but in the time of Jacob's trouble, it's better that they try to take this and they try to say, well, you can take the mark and then when you see Jesus coming, you can cut your hand off. See, that's what it's saying. It's not saying that. It's saying before you even take the mark, it's better to cut your hand off. That, I can see someone trying to teach that. Uh, when it comes to that time period, you know, it's better to pluck your eye out than to take the mark and worship the beast. They go hand in hand. There is no, I can take the mark and not worship the beast. You take the mark, you're worshiping the beast. They go hand in hand. It's better to cut your hand off. It's better to take, I can see someone trying to teach that, but doctrinally, this is not for the time of Jacob's trouble. It's talking about in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. There's going to be people that go to hell in that time period because Jesus is going to be ruling and reigning with the rod of iron. There's people that their hearts are going to be fighting God and I don't want to do what you tell me, Lord, and they get punished. I still don't want to do what you tell me, Lord. He can forgive us. We're going to keep reading. There's people that he can forgive and there's people he's not going to forgive. He's God. In that time period, it's all based on works in that thousand year time period. And I believe if you look into it, we're going to be doing another study shortly. Um, Samuel, not Samuel, uh, Samson, starts with an S, I'm sorry, Samson. Samson's a good example of somebody in that thousand year reign that can lose, the, he lost the Holy Spirit. In other words, you can lose your right standing with the Lord and you can get it back. Samson got it back. He got the Holy Spirit back. He lost the Spirit and he got it back. In this time period, there's times where you can uh, lose your uh, right standing with the Lord and God can forgive you and you can get it back. And then you can lose it again, <laughs> permanently, in that time period. Kind of like Saul, uh, you can lose the Holy Spirit in that time period. You can lose your standing. Verse 9, And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out and cast it from thee. It is better for thee to enter into life with one eye rather than to having two eyes to be cast into hellfire. It's talking about the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Oh, no, 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 there's not going to be any more sin. Yes, there is. There's still going to be sin in that time period. Sin isn't done away with until after Satan is let loose at the end of that thousand year reign and he goes through and the people's hearts that were, they hated the Lord, they did what they were told, they put on a good show, they did what they're told, but their heart, they cursed God in their hearts. He's going to be able to talk to those people and get those people to try to turn against Jesus Christ after the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Right. Verse 10, Take heed that ye despise not one of these little ones. For I say unto you that in heaven there are angels to always hold, behold the face of my Father which is in heaven. For the Son of Man has come to save that which is lost. He's like, I'm here to save the Jewish people. We're going to set up the thousand year reign, I'm going to rule and reign, and I'm going to save that which is lost. Now he's saving that which is lost today. He saved me. I was lost. I was on my way to hell. But doctrinally, he's talking to the Jewish people. They're asking who's the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verse 12, How think ye, if a man have a hundred sheep, and one of them gone astray, doth he not leave the ninety and nine, and goeth into the mountains, and seeketh that which is gone astray? And if so be that he find it, verily I say unto you, he rejoiceth more of that sheep than of the ninety-nine which went not astray. Think about that. In the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, there's going to be people that go astray. And we're going to be ruling and reigning with him if we suffer for him. We're going to be ruling and reigning with him. And we're going to make sure that people get back on the right track. People that go astray, we try to bring them back. The ones that will come back, God will forgive and we rejoice over that. The ones that won't come back, what happens to them? Talked about it. Better that you cut your hand off than to go to hell. Better to pluck your eye out than to go to hell. Fourteen. Even so it is not... Even so, it is not the will of your Father which is in heaven that one of these little ones should perish. When he co we always talk about it. He's going to be ruling with the rod of iron, but there's still love there. He's going to be ruling and reigning, and his law word is law, and it's going to be enforced, but there's still some grace there. 
It's not his will that any should perish. One of these little ones should perish. Verse 15, we talk about this a lot for instruction and righteousness for the body of Christ, but this is going to be major like law and rule for the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Verse 15, Moreover, if thy brother shall trespass against thee, go and tell him his fault between thee and him alone. If he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. But if he will not hear thee, then take with thee one or two more, that in the mouth of two or three witnesses every word may be established. And if he shall neglect to hear them, tell it unto the church. We see church there, oh, it's saved by the believing, God-fearing men, saved by the blood, the death, burial, and resurrection. Church just means called out assembly. Okay, here it's talking about what he's talking about here, brother, the brethren, as far as the Jewish people, your brother. Tell them to the church, but if you neglect to hear the church, let him be unto thee as a heathen man and a publican. We take that and use that for instruction and righteousness today to say, hey, that's kind of how we should be treating our brothers and sisters in Christ. We're adopted in, and that's good instruction and righteousness. But remember, doctrinally, it's talking about the thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. He's going to tell people, this is how you're supposed to act. Verily I say unto you, whatsoever ye shall bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever ye shall loose on earth shall be loose in heaven. Again I say unto you, that if two of you shall agree on earth as touching anything that they shall ask, it shall be done for them of my Father which is in heaven. Why? For where two or three are gathered together in my name, there am I in the midst of them. That's why it's called a church. It's a called out assembly, but they're called out in His name. That's going to be the same in the, in the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going to have a church in the time of Jacob's trouble. Just a called out assembly where they're called in His name. But it's not the body of Christ. The body of Christ leaves before the time of Jacob's trouble. You're going to have the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. There's going to be church. Called, it's a called out assembly where, they, where two or more are gathered in His name. But it's not the body of Christ. We're going to be coming. Some of us are going to be able to come back and rule and reign with them. Some are going to, I, I call it being benched. Some of us might be benched. And we're, we're going to be in heaven watching all this. Okay. That's why when you see, I think it was like, we think there's like 200,000 or, you know, 200 million or something. I forgot what it was, but the army that comes down with Jesus is a small amount. We think, well, that's a small amount, so there might not be that many people saved. Well, those are the ones that get to come down and rule and reign with Jesus Christ. There's not that many people that are suffering for Jesus Christ. People get saved, get messed up, get killed early, come home, they miss out on rewards. You can lose your inheritance as a Christian. But remember, where two or more gather together, it's called a church because they're gathering together in Jesus Christ's name. Today it's the body of Christ. That's why we call it the church. The church is the body of Christ today. In the time of Jacob's trouble, the church is the saints that are going through the time of Jacob's trouble. It's not the body of Christ. Okay. The body of Christ leaves. Uh, the thousand year reign. Okay, It's going to be the people in the millennial kingdom that come together in, God, in Jesus' name. He's ruling and reigning. That's our king. He tells us what to do. We do it. Today, instruction righteousness, he's my king. He tells me what to do and I do it. A lot of these false converts out there, when I hit them with that, it's like, if he's your king, then a king judges. Look in the Old Testament. They wanted a king to judge them. If Jesus is capital K, King of Kings, He's going to judge you. He's going to command you. He's going to tell you what to do. And a lot of these fakes and frauds out there, part of the easy believism, you look at them, it's like, Jesus doesn't reign in your life. Your flesh does. The world does. So I just preach the plan of salvation to them, and I move on. And they get upset. I'm saved. I'm saved. I'd rather err on the side of caution. Verse 21. Then came Peter to him and said, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me, and I forgive him? Till seven times? Jesus said unto him, I say unto thee until seven, not until, I say not unto thee until seven times, but until seventy times seven. You say, well, he's talking about present tense, right? Well, what does verse 23 say? Therefore is the kingdom of heaven, he goes back to talking about the kingdom of heaven. Today, are we supposed to forgive our brothers and sisters in Christ? Absolutely. They come truly repenting. They're sorry for what they did. And you see a change. They're going back to doing what's right. You're supposed to forgive them. You're not supposed to hold bitterness in your heart or hate in your heart. But in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, it's going to become like law. You forgive your brothers. It's a sign of someone whose heart 
They love their brothers and they love their brothers and sisters, their brethren, their, the people around them, and they love their king, Jesus Christ. We see in verse 23, Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him ten thousand talents. This is what I'm talking about in the story where it talks about how you can forgive people. You're wrong, you've done wrong, you owe Jesus Christ. He can forgive you. Verse 25. But forasmuch as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold to his wife and children, sold, and his wife and children, and all that he had, and payment be made. Now what's it? And I believe, I trust the Lord. He does these things to test people, to see what your heart is. Look at the servant. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He's not jumping down saying, oh, you should just be able to forgive me. You're Jesus. You're, it's, it's under the blood. It's under, you should be able to forgive. He falls down on his knees and says, give me time and I will pay thee all. Lord, give me a chance. Let me make up for what I did wrong. Lord, give me a chance. This is in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Today, you can't make up for sin. Thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, you can't make up for sin. But I'm saying, he's got that attitude, that heartfelt sorrow. I'm sorry. Have patience with me and I'll pay thee all. Verse 27. Then the Lord of the servant was moved with compassion and loosed him and forgave him the debt. Jesus looked at the heart. He's sincere. I'm going to forgive him. Verse 29, or 28. But what happens to the servant over time? Remember, it's all about works in that time. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. He was forgiven for a greater amount of sum, but he couldn't forgive one of his fellow servants. For instruction righteous today, brothers of Christ, how many times have you wronged the brother in Christ, pushed him away, did wrong, and they forgave you? And yet you can't forgive them when they make a mistake? We need to be a little bit more forgiving when it comes to the body of Christ. Doctrinally, he says, at the very top, he says, Uh, verse 23, therefore is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the thousand year reign again. He took him by the throat, pay me all that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. He had the same attitude that he had towards the king. But sometimes over time you forget where you've been. I'm trying to apply this for instruction and righteousness today, brother says Christ. The Bible says, remember who you were when you were lost. That there was a time period that you were without Christ and without hope in the world. You were without God, who is Christ, Jesus Christ. You were without God in the world and without hope in the world. Remember that you were that person over there that was so filthy and wicked and you needed Jesus Christ. But some of us start to get high and mighty. We start getting prideful. We start getting bitterness to the world. And we start thinking that, nah, there's just no hope for them. I'm not going to preach the plan of salvation to them. There's just no, they don't want it. You're still to preach the plan of salvation to them. I, I thank the Lord God Almighty that He didn't have that attitude with me. Oh, He's just behind, He's just beyond hope. He's just beyond hope. Have you forgotten, brother and sister Christ? I mean, some of you are new. But have you forgotten the testimonies out there? Or how bad some of the brethren are out there? And how God saved them? He can save a wretch like me. He can save anybody. You've got to repent and believe. Confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. You come to God broken. He looks at the heart. It's not about the head. It's the heart. This guy forgot that. And some of the brethren out there are forgetting that for today when it comes to the body of Christ and the lost world. Forgiving the body of Christ because you've wronged the body of Christ plenty of times in your life. And how we treat the lost world. We, we still need to give them the benefit of the doubt as far as preaching the gospel to them once. You need to try. Don't look at them and say, this person is just so filthy and wicked, there's no way he wants to get saved or she wants to get saved, so I'm not going to preach the plan of salvation. I'm not going to give them a gospel track. No, you need to give them a gospel track. You need to try, brothers and sisters of Christ. 
there's brethren out there in ministry that they're getting to the point where they're almost like they're, motiv they're, motiv they're not motivating people to preach the gospel. They're motivating people to just sit there. We need to be preaching the gospel. Okay. One of the vi videos I watched, and this wasn't a brother in Christ, um, he was trying to motivate people to go back to the Babel building system today. Because of everything that's going on out there, a lot of people are not going back to the Babel building system, and he's misquoting scripture, he's missing up uh, dispensations, and trying to push people to get back into the Babel building system so they can get that income. Mm -hmm. They forgot. Don't forget who you are, who you were, and who you are today. Don't forget the old man, in other words. He's dead and buried. Make sure he stays dead and buried. But remember the new man, what Jesus Christ did for you. The king healed, or healed, forgave this man. Jesus Christ forgave me of all the sins that I've committed when I was lost. And to this day, I'm still faithful. I keep coming to him with my sins present tense, and he's faithful to forgive. We need to be the same way. Verse 30, what was his attitude? Have patience with me and I will pay thee all, the servant. What was the, the, the main servant there that uh, God, the king forgave him? What was his attitude? Did he have the same attitude as the king? Having compassion? No. Verse 30, and he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what he had done, they were sorry and came and told unto the Lord all that was done. Verse 32, Then this Lord, after that he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all the debt, because thou desirest me. Shouldst not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. That's a good picture of hell. People think, well, we always preach this. You're going to owe Jesus Christ and you're going to pay everything back. And since you can't pay for it, you'll be paying for it for all eternity in the lake of fire. First hell and then death and hell is tossed into the lake of fire. You're going to be paying for it for all eternity. So all was due, paid, all was due to, unto him. Verse 35, So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your heart forgive not every one his brother their trespass. Okay, you read the, that chapter, and I was reading it, it's like, okay, it's evidence that in the thousand year reign, because that's what that's directed at, the, the kingdom of heaven is the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. There's sin in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. There's people getting punished in the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Okay? This deception, this illusion, brother, sister, Christ, that in that thousand year reign, that it's eternal security and it's belief in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is ludicrous. Jesus is physically present, ruling and reigning with a rod of iron. There's still love there. There's still some grace there. But it's based off of works, and His word is law, and it will be enforced. You offend one of these little ones, you're going to pay. If you become like that servant that in that thousand year reign where you get forgiven and you have other servants that forgive you, but you won't forgive your brothers and sisters that are out there, because everybody's a servant to Jesus Christ during that thousand year reign, they all serve Jesus Christ. He's their king. He's my king, but we're talking about the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Don't fall for the nonsense out there that salvation's always been the same from Genesis to Revelation. That's a lie. That's a total lie, and it's damning some people to hell because they're taking things from different dispensations and trying to apply them today. Like you can lose your salvation. You can't lose your salvation today. You can lose it in the thousand, uh, thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. You can lose it in the time of Jacob's trouble. But you can't lose it today. You can't. So, Brother Says Christ, I stand with what Peter Ruckman would always say, hardcore, hardcore, hardcore. You need to know this book. You need to stay in this book, and you need to be reading this book every day. Okay? There was a time where I hardly knew this book, when I was newly saved. But over time, 
listening to the Old Testament over and over, even the hard parts, over and over. I read through the New Testament. That's my morning and evening reading is New Testament. Get to Revelation, go back to, to Matthew 1. Get all the way to Revelation, the end of Revelation, new heaven, new earth, uh, new Jerusalem comes down uh, as, a bride adorn, as, as a bride adorned for, I forgot, the husband, I, I'm messing that part up, but as a bride that's adorned. Okay, it's going to come down. New heaven, new earth. We go out into eternity. There's the tree of life there. The leaves there are to heal the nations. There's 12 fruit. So each nation, 12 nations, each nation will come up every month at their appointed time. And there's certain fruit for each nation. You know, there's that stuff there. Oh, we're done. Okay, Lord, are you going to come? Ah, he hasn't come yet. i got to patiently wait. i got to go back and start all over in Matthew chapter 1. Let's go. And that's what I'm doing. I'm on Matthew 18 now. And brothers and sisters Christ, you need to know this book. It's going to get harder and harder for the wolves in sheep's clothing out there to deceive you. It's going to be harder for people that aren't wolves in sheep's clothing, but they're deceived. The Bible talks about people that are being, they're, they're deceived, they're being, they're deceiving and being deceived. Someone could come along that they're not necessarily a wolf in sheep's clothing, but they were deceived and they're trying to pass on that deception. It's going to be harder and harder for people to deceive you, brothers and sisters Christ, if you stay in the book. And you know this book like you need to know it. You read it every day. You study it every day. When you come across instruction righteous, you come across doctrine that's for us today, you apply it to your life today. And you live it. Okay? I just wanted to read that with you, brothers and sisters of Christ, because I love the Word of God, and I love that the God has blessed me with being allowed to be part of His ministry. And um, just remember, to, if, if you take away from this, remember one thing. That thousand year reign, there's no eternal security in that thousand year reign. That's why, because the whole point that we did the first part was because he was wondering, well, then how is Satan able to deceive these people and do all this, the, you know, uh, all the nations that's more numeral than the sand? They surround the city and the saints that are faithful to the Lord at the end of the thousand year reign, after the thousand year reign. And they're, how is that even possible? Because it's not eternal security in that time period. People still have a choice. To serve Jesus as their king and obey him or disobey him and suffer the consequences. Once again, some people might be able to come back. Some people won't. Okay. Um, the other thing to get away from this, brothers and sisters Christ, what we talked about for us. We need to remember to have a forgiveness for our brothers and sisters in Christ. If they don't ask for forgiveness, that, that big thing where we have to forgive, we have to forgive. Uh, you give it to the Lord. That's how you forgive. You give it to the Lord and say, Lord, you deal with them. You deal with them. And, but if that brother comes to you and he is, it says, uh, we read over there, let's see, if he shall hear thee, thou hast gained thy brother. If he repents, you gain your brother. Well, if he doesn't repent, we're still supposed to forget. No, that's not what it says. It talks about how often shall I forgive my brother. And it says seven times, uh, 70 times seven. When a brother in Christ comes to you broken repentance and says, I'm sorry. Sorrow in his heart for what he did wrong to you. You need to forgive him. You need to keep forgiving him. Brothers and sisters of Christ, it's a hard life today as a Christian. It shouldn't be. It should be simple. But we struggle with the flesh a lot. And we get tempted by this world a lot. Okay? Some of us, um, we, do, we make mistakes and it allows evil spirits in to tempt us. I've heard brothers say, well, I'm under spiritual attack. And I'm like, well, you know that wickedness that you just allowed in your home? You just opened the door for Satan. You need to get that wickedness out of your life. Oh, I ain't going to do it. Well, then you're going to have to suffer being under spiritual attack. Right? Uh, the Bible says, resist the devil and he must flee. But brothers and sisters of Christ, we've got to forgive, forgive, forgive. Okay, someone comes in a truly repentant state and they're sorry, forgive them. If they're going to be stubborn and prideful, you're not to hate them. The Bible says you, you don't treat them like an enemy. You don't hate them. You don't build up bitterness in your heart towards them. You give them to God and say, Lord, I don't want to hate him. I love him. He's my brother in Christ. Lord, please help him see the error of his ways. Please help him get back on the right track, Lord. I give him to you. That's what you got to do. That's what you got to do. But I wanted to read that because this was another good chapter on the fact that there is still sin in that thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Sin hasn't been done away with yet. Okay? 
What's the cost of sin? Death. Is there still death in that time period? Absolutely. When does death and hell get tossed into the lake of fire? After the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ. Death is still in the world. As long as there's death in the world, that means there's sin in the world. You can't get away from that. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace. Grace and peace for all of you, brothers and sisters of Christ. And please pray for that for me. Grace and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. And my love for you, which we just read about there, loving your brothers and sisters of Christ, forgiving them, my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for watching.